de Hidalgo, que está con nosotros ahora ayudándonos, porque gracias a su generosa colaboración, hoy podemos conectarnos y compartir estas jornadas en streaming por YouTube y otras redes. También quiero agradecer a todos los miembros del grupo Cuestiones del Lenguaje por el tiempo que le dedicaron a la organización de las jornadas y por el, por el alto grado de compromiso asumido. En particular quiero agradecer a la traductora pública Gabriela González, con quien compartimos ahora la presentación, y al equipo de traductoras del grupo que se pusieron al hombro este gran desafío tecnológico. Agradezco también a los destacados oradores porque sin su valiosa participación y gran entusiasmo estas jornadas no hubieran sido posibles. Y por supuesto, gracias a todos ustedes, la audiencia, por apoyarnos y confiar en nosotros. Los dejo ahora con Gabriela. Bueno, muchas gracias Pedro por la introducción. Eh, como dijo Pedro, yo soy traductora pública, vengo de, como él explicó, en este grupo hay traductores, profesores, y bueno, yo soy de, del grupo de los traductores. Eh, quería contarles que por 1999, eh, un premio Nobel de Literatura debatió en unas jornadas en la Escuela de Traductores de Toledo sobre la callada labor de los que universalizamos las letras. Manifestó que es un trabajo mal considerado y peor pagado y que deberíamos cobrar derechos de traducción. Seguí leyendo y dijo algo que lo voy a leer textual. Dice que los escritores hacen las literaturas nacionales y los traductores hacen la literatura universal. Nos permiten a los que no podemos conocer todas las lenguas que se, eh, que se perdón, al, nos permite a todos los que no podemos conocer todas las lenguas que se pueda leer algo escrito en Japón, Rusia, Finlandia. Los traductores convierten las lenguas en mi propia lengua, por eso seríamos más pobres sin ellos. Yo he aprendido muchísimo con ellos, he aprendido a leerme, porque a veces se plantean dudas que no sé aclarar. Todo está claro para mí en lo que escribo, pero no en lo que significa y tengo que pensarlo varias veces. Ellos me han dicho que no todo lo que uno escribe en su lengua no es tan fácil de entender. No me pude contener, busqué una manera de contactarme con él, le envié un fax agradeciéndole su reconocimiento e invitándolo a involucrarse con los traductores en Argentina. Pasaron unas semanas... Eh, y un domingo a la madrugada recibo un fax eh, en el que agradecía, pero tampoco entendía muy bien eh, por qué yo le agradecía o estaba tan sensibilizada por este reconocimiento que él nos había hecho. Y bueno, le expliqué que realmente era muy difícil muchas veces eh, explicar qué es lo que hacemos explicarle a un cliente, explicarle un, a una persona que no tiene formación en letras lo difícil que es trasladar eh, una idea, un mensaje, no solo de un idioma a otro, sino de una cultura a otra. Bueno, se involucró de tal manera con nosotros que esto dio comienzo a una relación que duró hasta que falleció. Incluso hizo un cambio de agenda en algún momento para abrir un congreso de traductores y quedamos luego en contacto con su esposa que también es traductora. José Saramago afirmaba que los traductores y escritores conforman una especie de comunidad a la que él llama o llamaba la tribu de la sensibilidad de la que hay que sentirse orgullosos. Ese es nuestro reino, la sensibilidad es lo mejor que uno puede tener. Pero además de pertenecer a la tribu de la sensibilidad, eh, yo quiero agregar de que sabemos que nuestra formación es permanente y valoramos a todos los profesionales que nos permitan formarnos, especializarnos, crecer y seguir aprendiendo. Estas jornadas tienen que ver justamente con ese espíritu, conocer y escuchar a profesionales que tan generosamente nos comparten sus conocimientos para seguir formándonos, actualizándonos y creciendo. En estas jornadas ustedes van a ver oradores que no son solamente traductores, pero que son fundamentales también en la formación del traductor. Bueno, yo quiero agradecer a Pedro, en primer lugar, eh, no solo por haber apostado a, a estas jornadas y haber ayudado tanto y haber invertido tantas horas 
para que podamos estar todos aquí reunidos, sino por su respeto hacia la traducción y los traductores. Eh, tiene un compromiso con, hacia nuestra profesión eh, que es admirable realmente. Siempre nos escucha y, y toma cada una de esas palabras y de esos aportes que podemos hacer. Eh, agradecer al comité organizador al comité técnico y a los moderadores por su dedicación y compromiso. A los oradores, en primer lugar, por la alegría que nos manifestaron cuando fueron convocados y siempre por la generosidad que tienen en compartir sus conocimientos. A los asistentes y al grupo con cuestiones de lenguaje y a todos los que mencioné anteriormente, eh, quiero agradecerles por algo que me enseñó hace 20 años mi hija cuando apenas tenía 4 años, que es eh, que ella es el día de hoy que lo sigue considerando algo invaluable e intangible para todos, que es el tiempo. Eh, hemos mm, dedicado mucho tiempo en estas jornadas, eh, todos, y, y todos desde nuestro lugar de asistentes también le vamos a estar in, eh, a, eh, dedicando mucho tiempo en estos dos días. Vamos a invertir tiempo en esta capacitación, en esta formación, en este intercambio. Y realmente en estos tiempos de pandemia donde eh, nos queremos abrazar, salir, tomar mate, comer asado, dedicarle tanto tiempo eh, a seguir estando detrás de una pantalla, creo que es doblemente meritorio. Así que bueno, eh, bienvenidos, muchas gracias y que empiece la fiesta. Los invitamos eh, a, a escuchar ahora a nuestro orador destacado, el profesor eh, Ruslan Milkos.
Bueno, ¿me escuchan? Sí, te escucho. Bueno, perfecto. Bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, vamos a dar inicio a la primera mesa de estas jornadas. Eh, tenemos el honor de abrir estas jornadas con el doctor Ruslan Mirkov, quien es eh, una persona a quien conocemos desde hace más de 15 años eh, y que invito a que vayan a nuestra página web a leer su biodata completa, eh, que es súper extensa eh, y realmente... Eh, es digna de, de ser leída en su totalidad. Por cuestiones de tiempo, yo simplemente me voy a limitar a decir que tiene eh, una extensa producción científica, más de 250 trabajos, 15 libros, artículos en revistas y capítulos en otros libros sobre distintos ámbitos de procesamiento del lenguaje natural. Eh, su trayectoria investigadora es de relevancia internacional y ocupa los primeros puestos del ranking según el sistema de evaluación británico. Ha hecho infinitas contribuciones al mundo de los traductores, junto con los miembros de su instituto de investigación en la Universidad de Wolverhampton. En 2011 le fue concedido el título de doctor honoris causa por la Universidad de Plovdiv en Bulgaria en reconocimiento a su brillante carrera profesional e investigadora. Como dije antes, eh, es un placer tenerlo, lo consideramos un amigo de los traductores argentinos y eh, antes de darle la palabra para comenzar a disfrutar de su presentación, quiero decirles que Ruslan es una persona sumamente generosa y que siempre que lo hemos contactado para alguna charla ha estado predispuesto y dedicado a cada uno de los eventos en los que uno lo convoca. Así que bueno, muchísimas gracias eh, por haber aceptado esta invitación y comenzamos entonces a escuchar al doctor Metcalf. Muchísimas gracias por uh, invitarme. I need to be able to share content. Um, so, if you could give me the, the host option. Yes, you are ready as. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it is really a big, big pleasure to be able to be keynote speaker at this conference. This conference has to do with predicting the future. And uh, but before I start to predict the future, also for translators and interpreters, I would like to say. Thank you very much to Gabriela Gonzalez. She said a few, a few nice words about me, which probably I don't deserve. But I would like to thank her very much for inviting me to give this keynote speech at this conference. Uh, and it's my honor and pleasure to give this talk uh, for all the Argentinian students and for the students from all over the world. Um, so I wish I was a clairvoyant so that I could predict the future. If I was a clairvoyant, I would help all of you become millionaires, but I'm not, unfortunately. So this uh, presentation has to do, I have two interactive activities. I have two questions. If you go to this website, slide.com, and if you could actually type the number L7478, L capital L, then you'll be able to ask two questions, uh, answer two questions that I'm asking. If there are enough online participants on WebEx, is going to be possible. This won't work on the streaming because there is some delay. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I probably won't be able to hear the sound. Some of my slides have sound. So I'll try to um, somehow guess when the sound finishes. But if occasionally I speak over the sound, forgive me for this, but at least I hope that you'll be able to hear the sound. So this is, um, actually let me go to this first slide. So I was asking this question. I wanted to see from where people come. Uh, I can see that some of you are already replying. 
we have most people from Argentina, we have people from Serbia, from Bulgaria, from the United Kingdom, from Mexico, from Spain, from Portugal. Thank you very much for coming from all over the world, from Brazil, of course. You can see the dynamics, it changes all the time. Um, th thank you very much. Now I'll have to move on so that I continue with the conversation because we are really limited by the time. Thank you for replying. I can see people from, Parag from uh, different places, including Mar de Plata. Thank you for this. Paraguay as well. Uh, so my next slide has to do with a little mm, flashback in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the past. I I'm going to go in the past. Why? Because I would like us to, you to see those, to have a look at those images. You see William Shakespeare, you can see Goethe, you can see Cervantes, you can see, um, Dante Alighieri. So those were people who were master of writing. My question is, do we have the same masses of writing nowadays, uh, four or five hundred years on, as we had then? If you ask me, I'm going to say maybe not. But let's try to be safe and not to make too bold statements. And I'm going to say, okay, today we may not have as good writers as those four or five years in the past, such masters of writing. But I would say that um, in this sense, in the sense of linguistic intelligence for me, which is the art of expressing oneself linguistically, we haven't made much progress. So historically, Historically, we haven't progressed much on this topic, on the topic of being able to express ourselves eloquently. We don't have Shakespeare today, we don't have Goethe today, we don't have Cervantes. But let's not say that today our authors not, are not better. Let's simply be safe and say that the linguistic intelligence has not really made much progress. So look at this plot, please. So the, um, the blue line is the linguistic intelligence of human. So this is the, um, what I call the ability to express yourself, to understand language, to translate language, to express yourself in language. So having given those examples of those big names like Shakespeare and Goethe and Dante Alighieri and Cervantes, I would say that this intelligence is constant. It hasn't gone up, it hasn't gone down. So let's be safe and say this. However, now I'm going to look at something else. I'm going to look at the computer intelligence and in particular I'll, I'm going to look at how computers translate. And if you look at this, um, as actually, this red line, um, it was zero because there were no computers. And then in, in the 20th century, this goes up. Why? Because we'll go back into the history again and we'll see what happened. So the first computer was developed between 43 and 46. And um, in Germany, United Kingdom, and United States, I'm not going to say who was the first. It had to do a different model. But remember this year, 46, because only one year later, Only nine, one year later, the American statistician and mathematician had this idea. He said, I'm going to encode the source language and then decode it into a target language. So he had this very simple idea um, that language can be somehow encoded and decoded. So he thought this was machine translation. He thought it was very easy, a statistically feasible problem. By the way, there was some sound on this slide. Did you hear the sound, Eugenia? Did you hear the sound? So you didn't hear any sound, right? Anyway, so it doesn't matter. If you don't hear any sound, uh, those slides can go without sound. So basically the idea was that machine translation would work like this, and then it didn't work very well. This is why there was this uh, joke. Mm, there was a joke that there was a system which was translated from Russian into, from English into Russian, and then from Russian into English, and then the sentence to be translated was the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and then into Russian and back into English and then the output was the vodka is strong but the meat is rotten. Obviously this is a joke but it comes to show that the quality of machine translation was really very poor in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 60s and at the very beginning. So why did he fail? He fell because uh, he had a very simple model. He thought that um, everything was very simplistic. Uh, that language is irregular, is like mathematics, but in fact language is irregular and ambiguous. His view was simplistic and he wouldn't have succeeded even if he had the supercomputers of today. So in the ALPA report, uh, which came out, which was commissioned by the US government, 
The, this report said that there is no immediate or predictable prospect of useful machine translation. As a result, mm, uh, the research in machine translation uh, stopped, and only in the 80s, the Japanese projects revised machine translation, and in 85, there were 500,000 pages translated by machine translation. So remember this, language is irregular and ambiguous. It's very difficult for computers to translate. It's very difficult for them to understand language. This is really a huge challenge, and this makes the whole task not only of translation, automatic translation, but also the whole task of processing language by computers is very, very difficult. So I don't know whether you can hear this. Uh, this is a um, video. Um, if you cannot hear it, I have to skip all the slides on which I have sound. Can I ask you, do you hear this sound? Eugenia, do you hear anything? And this is what I've done. This, 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 is what, this, this is what I've done, actually. If I go again to, um, this, is, this, is, this is what I did. Ah, maybe I did not do it. L l let me stop sharing. And then I, when I go to share, um, optimize it for motion V. Okay, now it's fine. And then, then I start sharing again. Okay, I apologize. I had to optimize the WebEx program now. You can uh, listen to this. Uh, tell me whether you can listen to this clip. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Und kann ich hören, Messwell? Ja, da. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. I mean, we are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? Well, okay, the reason why I showed you this video was um, I wanted to see how difficult is communication. So we had here a problem between humans. So it is going to be even more difficult if there is a communication between computers and humans. And um, I mentioned that language is ambiguous. Here an example of lexical ambiguity. This happens in Cuba. You can see that um, this person misunderstood the meaning of papa. He thought it was potato. It was, I mean, the Pope was, met, made, was meant as a result of this. Um, the, the note for the Pope was saying something wrong, welcome potato instead of welcome Pope. Uh, we have also semantic ambiguity when it has to do with semantic meaning. And here we have a sentence which says rabbit is ready for lunch. In this particular context, the rabbit is the agent ready to eat. And then in this context, the rabbit is ready for lunch, the rabbit is the patient ready to be eaten. So this type of ambiguity is called semantic ambiguity. And this is another type of ambiguity which makes the understanding of language by computers very, very difficult. And this is uh, another example of semantic ambiguities. We serve only men here. It could mean two things, that men are the recipients in this restaurant, but it could mean that they are on the menu. Those examples of ambiguity show how difficult language understanding could be, and it somehow has an impact also on automatic translation. And finally, I'm going to illustrate the idiomatic ambiguity, the multi-word expressions. Um, if I say it's raining cats and dogs, if I mean it literally, this is what happens, what the, um, the video showed, but otherwise it's a multi-word expression, which it means it rains a lot. In Spanish it would be llueve a cantara, if I'm not mistaken. So language is irregular and ambiguous, but now we're seeing that language is also phraseological. It is based on phraseological units on multi-word expression. So multi-word expression is a combination of words which as a whole carry a meaning different from their word by word literal meaning. And an example is to pay attention. Uh, in Spanish will be prestar atención. You see that prestar atención is not a literary translation of to pay attention. So in order for you to be able to translate a multi-word expression, whether it's a, with a computer or on your own, you should be able to recognize it. Every cloud has a silver lining. 
is another example, which is an idiom. And in order for you to be able to translate it, you need to know as a human translator that it's a multi-word expression or the computer program has to recognize it before translating it automatically. What is interesting is that there are no fewer multi-word expression uh, than single words. So they even more than the words. Can you hear me well? Okay, I have to speak a bit faster because of the time limits. So another example of multi-word expression, and you can, you can hear the sound now. The sound of a fly, a fly off the handle means to lose your temper suddenly. This is a multi-word expression in English. Multi-word expressions are really pain in the neck for natural language processing. They're pain in the neck for machine translation. It's so difficult for programs to translate them. I'll give you a simple example. Here is a multi-word expression, kick the bucket, which means to die. I took, it, took this sentence from the Longman Dictionary of Idioms, and then I ran three machine translation programs, prompt, from English into Spanish. You see how prompt translates it, very poor translation, kick the bucket, doy un puntapié. Then we see how Sistran does it, equally bad, into Spanish. Finally, uh, uh, Google Translate does a bit better, and it does give you an, um, a correct idiom, but however, it is, um, it's not f correct because the conjugation is wrong. Those results are from 2015. I uh, repeated this experiment three years on, three years later, with the same programs, prompt equally bad, um, Systrum equally badly translated the multi-word expression to keep the bucket. Um, Google Translate this time was based on deep learning, not only on statistics, on statistics, and Google Translate did not do well either. And here we have DeepL, which is a program which is well known for translation. It is based on deep learning. It does not do very well either. What does it mean? Even though we have had some recent advances in the field of machine translation, machine translation cannot really cope with multi-word expressions. This is one of the difficulties of language, one of the difficulties of this language phenomenon, not only a multi-word expression, but multi-word expression is one of them, which makes it very, very difficult for machine translation to translate as well as humans. And still, linguistic intelligence of computers, um, even though they have been many, many advances, it is still inferior to humans. We can develop programs which can get closer to human intelligence. I'm going to recently what people have been trying, Machine learning, this is an example of a program which learns, from example, what is a spam and what is not a spam. So all those examples here, which have been tagged as spam, next time the program uh, comes across new text, it will know what could be a spam and what could not be. And then this is an example of deep learning, learning at different levels. This is the fashion now, the buzzword. Deep learning is everywhere, natural language processing has made huge advances using deep learning, also machine translation, and machine translation, which is called on deep learning, is called neural machine translation. Um, so machine translation is being used every day. It provides um, translation for 200 million users every day. Um, it surpasses what professional translators do in one year. And here is another question I ask on Slido. I was going to ask you how do you rate the quality of machine translation from zero, from one to 10? 10. 10 very low and nine very good. So from your, actually, you have to select number of stars. From your actually choice, you have to select stars. So one star is very poor, nine star, 10 star is very good. So I can see now that most of you say that the quality is three or maybe seven or maybe nine. So thank you very much for participating in this live poll. It is very interesting to see what you think. So most of you think that, in fact, machine translation quality is five, which means not too bad, but not too good either. Interesting, so I can see many people replying. Well, I have 31 replies, 33 replies, 36 replies, 38 replies. So who is winning? Well, those who, Rated four and five. Well, five. Okay, the quality is now is four. So you think the quality is four? Fair enough. Thank you very much for this poll. We say that machine translation quality is somehow okay, but not perfect. Thank you very much again. So um, why is Google Translate why it has been successful? Well, because it 
uses bilingual corpora and it uses statistical techniques. And Google Translate is even used today by professional translators. I'm chair of an um, annual conference in London, which is called Translating in the Computer, and I meet a lot of translators. I work a lot of translators, and some of them say that they are asked by their governments or their companies to use Google Translate in order to translate text, and by doing so, they do it faster because they post edit the output of Google Translate. So the next success story was uh, statistical machine translation after rule-based translation, which was very fashionable in the 90s and the early 2000s. This is simply a simple example of how uh, machine translation learns from data and from existing human translations. And the more human translation we have, the more it learns. And statistical machine translation was a success. However, the really the big, the big story, the big success story is neural machine translation. This is simply an illustration how deep learning operates on several levels. Um, so deep learning is used everywhere. It is used for face recognition in every, almost every natural language processing task. And also it is used very much in machine translation. And the so-called neural uh, uh, machine translation has been really a buzzword and success story in the last um, five years. So to such an extent that um, I'm going to use a few slides by a former student of mine, Sheila Castillo, who is Brazilian. She did um, uh, an evaluation project. She wanted to evaluate some of the claims coming out in the press by some companies. For instance, you read things like Google 2016. We have bridged the gap between human and um, machine translation quality. You read things like Microsoft. They're saying that they have achieved human parity and news translation from Chinese into English. SDL travels, they're claiming that they have cracked the Russian to English neural machine translation with near perfect translation quality. You read all kinds of things and translators really getting worried because they're going to think that one day the computers will take away their jobs. You see all kinds of press releases, don't believe them before you do a study yourself. So what Sheila and her colleagues wanted to do is to find out whether all those headlines in the newspaper make sense. They did um, a proper evaluation. I'm not going to go into detail because we need to spend a lot of time uh, discussing uh, proper evaluation strategy for uh, machine translation. Those of you who would like to do a PhD or a project on how to evaluate machine translation, please get back to me and we can discuss it, but there are different techniques. One of the things that some of my students are using, they use the so-called productive, productive actually evaluation. They post-edit the output of machine translation and they measure the number of strokes in terms of post-editing and they measure how time it takes to post-edit a text and the more they post-edit, the poorer the, qual poorer the quality, the less they post-edit, the better the quality. So there are different ways of evaluating this. But basically what Sheila and her colleagues um, found out, um, and obviously they cited a lot of headlines where translators are really afraid of their future, they find out that in fact um, this is really the hype and this is the reality. So the blue line is the reality. So basically what the hype says is not really correct. It is not true that neural machine translation is as good as human translation, but it is improving. So the reality means that machine translation improves and actually the hype is in red, but also the hype shows that neural, ma neural machine translation has been taking off in terms of quality. And this is something very important for us to watch out. So. So the conclusions are that uh, the results are still far away from human translations, but this hype about neural machine translation should be treated cautiously because one day the computers will get really very, very close to human translation. There have been, however, still quite a few success stories. Even in the 70s, we had this Meteo program developed in Montreal, Canada. They would translate on a daily basis uh, weather forecasts from English into French, French and they were perfect perfect, like a human translation. But why? Because the secret was not so much the machine translation. The secret was the sub-language of weather forecasts, where all the sentences were very short. They didn't have any verbs, like winds going west, or rains slowing down, or rates, uh, or snow um, coming tonight. So all those sentences are very simple to translate, and they were translated perfectly 
with machine translation. Now I'm going to um, share with you a short video which was shared to me by the um, chief investigator in Microsoft uh, trans uh, Automatic Translation. They purchased Skype. I know him very well and he's a very nice guy. Um, I hope you enjoy this video. Hi, can you guess where I live? ¿Te encuentras en América del Norte? Yes. Do you live in Central Mexico? Sí. ¿Te encuentras en Estados Unidos de América? Yes. Do you live in a capital city? Sí. ¿Estás cerca de Seattle? We are very close to Seattle. Are you in Mexico City? Sí. ¿Estás en Tacoma? Yes. Very good guess. Gracias. Thank you. Do you like living in Mexico City? Te gusta vivir en la ciudad de México. Aquí está muy lindo. Here is very nice. What do you do for fun? ¿Qué haces para divertirte? Voy a las playas de México. I'm going to the beaches of Mexico. I like to swim. Me gusta nadar. A mí también. Me too. Where in the world do you wish to travel? ¿A dónde en el mundo te gustaría viajar? A Rusia. To Russia. ¿Y tú? And you? Everywhere. <laughs> Sería increíble algún día verte en México. It would be amazing to see you someday in Mexico. I would really like to visit you sometime. Me gustaría mucho visitarte algún día. A mí también. Me too. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this video. So this is a real example. This is something which really works, um, which is um, basically automatic translation in a limited domain. So Microsoft developed this domain of young uh, people chatting, and this is a real example which really works very well. Now let's go back again into, I have, looking at the clock, I have 20 minutes left. I'm going to finish in 20 minutes, definitely. I know that I'll be cut off after 45 minutes if I don't finish. So let's go back into the, Let's go, in, in, back, let's go back into the past, in the early 70s, a little bit after Beatles split. Um, and what happened in the early 70s? At that time, we had really mm, no existing machine translation. Machine translation was very poor. And uh, translators had given up on machine translation. So they had to look at different solutions. So there was a need for them to develop new tools, and this is how slowly developed the idea of translation memory systems. So Krohmann was a, a German translator who developed the idea to reuse existing human translation. Athen was a British translator who eight years after that proposed to retrieve not only the same identical translated text, but also similar ones, and this resembled the notion of fuzzy matches in current translation memory systems, but it took another decade before their ideas were commercialized. And we saw systems like like STAR and Tratos, which in, in turn uh, developed into dramatic changes for the translation workflow. And what the translators want to do, they want to increase their productivity, they want to be able to access previous translations, and this was the whole idea of translation memory system. I'm sure that most of you know how they work, but let me give you here a screenshot of how Travels works. In this first sentence, you're translating um, this, this first sentence you want to translate into German. So the system checks in your translation memory and finds that a similar sentence has been translated already into German. The only difference are the words delete and step. Everything else is the same. So basically, it offers you this translation, and what the translator has to do is just to translate delete and step. So you uh, save a lot of time by just translating two words. So translation memory systems are mainly for professional translators. They use database of previously translated text. They use the so-called metric edit distance, which is the Levenstein distance. Um, it is called also fuzzy matching, but it's a very simple statistical measure. measure. 
So those systems make sure that no center is translated twice. They ensure consistency, and basically they ensure that no texts are translated twice. It's they're very uh, actually useful for repetitive texts. So those are the most actually well-known uh, translation memory systems, which are really uh, well-known, and I'm sure that some of you have used have used them a lot. In recent years, MemoQ did well, and in the last few years, another very good performer is MemSource, um, which has attracted a lot of um, users. So the translation memory system have a lot of limitations. If you read this sentence, the wild boy is destroying his new toy, and sentence two, the wild chief is destroying his new tool, and the wild children are destroying their new toy, basically which are more, more similar. Obviously, semantically, the most similar ones are um, one and three. But um, translation memory systems are very easily fooled. They'll think that one and two are more similar. Why? Because in terms of matching of characters or strings, they're closer. So machine translation memory system can be very easily fooled. And uh, Gabriela Gonzalez, who kindly introduced me today, she visited my research group in 2004 in Wolverhampton, and she inspired me to work on new generation of translation memory systems. And ever since, we have done a lot. We have developed new, um, new generation translation memory systems. Those are all many of our publications of myself and my students who have been working on this topic. In our recent projects, we use deep learning for translation memory system to match and compare not only the syntax of sentences, but also the semantics. And to really uh, give you a flavor, just a flavor, not to go into details, this is a slide which I used in a um, presentation which I gave to the Brazilian Association of Translators, Researchers in Translation. So let's assume that you have to, you have this sentence to translate with a translation memory system. I like Rio de Janeiro, which is such an attractive and exciting place. And then you have this one as well, which is different. Uh, the city is full of attraction and excitement. And the third one, I dislike Rio de Janeiro, which is such an unattractive and unexciting place. So, so if you measure the similarity between sentence A and sentence B using the the traditional edit distance used in commercial translation memory system, they give a score of 72. We developed a measure which is called semantic textual similarity, which is from one to five, edit distances from zero to 100. In our case, it's three. So let's see what happens if we compare two other sentences, like and dislike. Edit distance, again, the commercial translation memory systems are very easily fooled. They think those two are really, uh, very, very high in terms of similarity, whereas our system gives it only one. This is a summary which shows that, in fact, um, our measure, uh, semantic, uh, semantic uh, similarity, actually can see that those sentences are semantically similar, and the edit distance, which is typical of commercial um, Translation memory systems cannot do this, whereas between those two sentences, our measure, our metric sees that those two are completely different, and the edit distance, the fuzzy matching of commercial translation memory systems cannot do this. So this is a very, really very promising um, research, which actually shows that we have developed a metric, not only one, we developed several, which measure actually the semantic closeness between two segments in a translation memory system. And this is a good, basis for the future translation memory system, the translation memory systems of the future, which compare the semantic uh, meaning of the segments, not only their strings, not only their string similarity. So this is um, our latest research on translation memory systems, on new generation translation memory system. Our latest project was using the latest deep learning techniques to do this. I'm not going to go into detail. Those of you who are interested, interested please send me an email and I'll send you a copy of our latest paper. I want to say a few words about interpreters. They have been really forgotten. Um, there, there's not much for, trans for interpreters out there. The ones who are benefiting from technology are mainly uh, translators. So uh, they really mm, have been forgotten. They, they actually uh, they need tools to support their work. Um, but 
really they they're not so many tools they, there has been recent interest between 2017 and 2020 a different conference this is the one mentioned in london and last year at rnlp in varna uh, so what um i would like to mention two projects the vip 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 project developed at the university of malaga and also at the university of mines germanstein by claudia fantioli those are two recent projects that have to do with developing tools for interpreters but i would like to share with you a few ideas on certain things that we're working on for interpreters so i see two types of application one assisting interpreters in the interpreters in the preparation of uh, when they prepare for an interpreted job when they have to develop familiarize themselves with a the new domain and then uh, to assist them during the interpreted job this is a more difficult one because while they interpret they don't want to be distracted most of them so this is an example of preparation for the job we can develop and we have developed different tools we generate automatically overview of the domain and by doing so the interpreters can familiarize themselves in a matter of half an hour or an hour with the with the domain with the most important things of the domain this is something that works very well using natural language processing techniques this is this is an offline before the interpreting job and this is a task where natural language processing perfectly works the challenge however is to help interpreters during the interpreting job this is very challenging having spoken to many many interpreters they have told me that what they need is help on the screen they would like to have actually the text-to-speech on the screen uh, so that they don't have to take notes this is something they want um, and basically they want to have their names dates and numbers highlighted even multi-word expression so that instead of taking notes of the names and the numbers they can just really have them on the screen they said that this is something which would help them a lot this is an example of a system that I would like to develop with some of my uh, students. I hope some of them are now attending this presentation. And this is something perfectly feasible. Imagine you have this text and imagine you have to interpret this. So the system uh, highlights those names and numbers, which you don't have to remember because they're highlighted by the system. And then the system automatically also translates them in the language so if you have to interpret from english into spanish the system offers you the translation of those really important terms and names and this according to interpreters will be very very helpful and this can be done in, this is a feasible job because we can use techniques like temporal processing name entity recognition to identify um, to identify dates to identify names, to identify terms. So this is a feasible task. This is simply a screen that I'm sharing with you that I want to, an idea that I would like to share with you. And then something more. Uh, can you emulate translation memory for interpreter? This is something interesting. So why not do something similar for interpreter? And this is my idea. There is some sound. I'll try not to speak over the sound, but I cannot hear the sound. So hopefully you can hear the sound. So let's imagine that you have a situation where you have um, somebody who is an English speaker who is going to speak and this has to be interpreted into Spanish and you have uh, Mal, uh, Mr. Valdis who will be listening to the speech by Mr. Burks and it, then you have the interpreter who is uh, Mrs. Potter and she has the so-called interpretation memory this is actually imagine translation memory in interpreting all the speeches are encoded into text and then you have all the speeches into text and their interpretation but all encoded as text so now what will happen is that each time there is an interpretation it will be again converted into text compared against the database and then displayed on the screen and then the interpreter will be able somehow to actually re re reuse this so this is how it will work our common equity has been increased through the intensification of our listed stock so let's assume that this is what the English speaker says and then the interpreter will have access to the interpretation memory she can see what actually this says and then she can be able to reuse it and also she can also uh, look for definition of certain expressions so now using this now she can say what she wants nuestro to say. 
So you see, this is simply an idea of how uh, interpretation memory of the future will work. I hope you have managed to hear this. Uh, I couldn't hear anything because for some reason my headset don't reproduce WebEx. So, but how far are computers for really replacing humans? How good are they at understanding fig figurative language, emotional language, translating literature and philosophy? I would say they're very, very far away. And just to give an example, I have worked this extensively on tr enough for resolution. If you read this sentence, there are not so many people who will tell me who is he and who is his and who is him in this sentence. It's not Tony Blair, it's, to it's not Peter Mandelson. It's difficult even for humans to understand. It is somebody, it is Peter Mandelson in Tony Blair's shoes. It's a different personality. So humans have difficulties with this sentence, let alone computers. So this means we're really far away still for perfect human intelligence. I wish I, were, I was a clairvoyant. People ask me at different conferences, conferences about language technology, about translation technology. They ask me to predict the future on a frequent basis. And I'm sorry, I can only say what I think. I'm not a clairvoyant. I'm not a clairvoyant. So I'm not a clairvoyant. And this is a slide. This cartoon was um, uh, done for me by Payal, somebody who works with me. She's from Hyderabad, India, a wonderful artist. So I'm not a clairvoyant. I cannot predict the future, but I'll tell you what I think. So be ready for my prediction. My prediction on the basis of many years of work in the field of natural language processing, of many years of work in the field of translation, uh, machine translation, translation memory, and in general, translation technology. What I think is the following. What I think is the following. So here is the human intelligence. This is, uh, again, what humans can say and translate. I think that the, the quality of linguistic intelligence will stay the same. There will be Shakespeare's and Cervantes's in the future, but not necessarily better than that. However, computers, you can see here this red line, they started going up in the 50s. Here in 2000, we have a huge steep, this is because natural language processing and machine translation, neural, neural machine translation are doing really very good advances. And we're going up, going up, going up. And then my prediction is that in 2200, so 180 years from now, the machines will be almost as good as humans, but not really as good as humans. So my prediction is that computers will be able to translate and interpret almost as well as humans, but not that well. So this is my prediction. And there'll be other jobs like post editors. So I don't think that translators and interpreters should worry too much at the moment. So what I'm saying is that the computers do not have the imagination of creativity of humans. They're very good at routine jobs. They do not intend to replace humans. They only wish to help. And the development of computer intelligence and the, developing, the development of a program which can translate and interpret as well as humans is a very long and winding road. Do you remember this song by the Beatles? The long and winding road from the late 60s? Yes, all this process is a long and winding road. So the important message is that don't get worried. Translators and interpreters are not endangered species. There will be jobs for you. Even if you have to change your profile, you'll be still working as something very close to interpreter or as translator. I'd like to thank you very much uh, for all this. This is a web page of my group, of myself. I'm at the end of my presentation, I think I made it within 45 minutes. And this was about my prediction what the future holds for humans, computers, translators and interpreters. This is my non clairvoyance view and in one minute you'll be able to ask questions or we can move to the next presentation. Professor Mitkov, uh, a few questions? Yes, if you have time, definitely. Can you see me? Can you see me on the screen? No, no, your uh, camera is off. Is my camera off? I don't know what's happening. Oh, yes. okay. Your camera okay. is off. Now you can see me, right? Yes, now I can see you. So, a question from the audience. 
Uh, what is the best uh, translation memory system? Uh, what do you recommend for translators? Well, I'm not, I wish one of those companies paid me to do publicity for them, but I'm not their agent. I, you're going to see in the next presentation where we introduce the, uh, where we introduce the Erasmus Mundus uh, master program that we work with the top companies who produce translation memory software. I can only say what the translators tell me. Travis used to be the hit of the early 2000s. After that, people started preferring MemoQ. MemoQ, Tradus was first, first developed in Germany. Now it's part of ASDL, which is a British company. Uh, and Mem MemoQ is a Hungarian company. They have been doing really very well. But in the very last four or five years, people speak very highly of MemSource, which is a Czech company based in Prague. And basically, they, um, the good thing with them is that just like MateCut, they are a web based machine translation. Uh, sorry, uh, translation memory tool. So I would say, from what the translators say, um, Trados, MemQ, MemSource, and I would also mention WordFast, developed by uh, my very good colleague and friend, Yves Champollion. So in my view, those are the top four ones. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to let you know that everyone is uh, very appreciative of your uh, uh, of your presentation, and everyone is very happy with it. And we have another question. Uh, somebody asks whether interpretation memory is an application. Is a software. It is going to be a future application. We haven't done it yet. I have uh, I have suggested it to some of my students. I have those ideas. I have developed those ideas, and those ideas have to be implemented. They haven't been implemented yet. This is something we want to do in the next two, three years. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me see if we have any other uh, questions. I think not. So I would like to thank you for your presentation. I think uh, everyone is very happy with it and uh, we'll see you in, your, in the next uh, talk. Um, so now, now I'm going to uh, end this, uh, uh, end this Yes, think? actually, we have we have uh, one more question sure. last minute. So uh, you s you mentioned that there are uh, no great new advances in human linguistics, but what do you think about the different uh, non-racist and non-binary languages among uh, the different languages? No, but I was speak. I, what I was referring was the linguistic in intelligence of humans. I was not. Uh, I mean, I was speaking about the ability of humans to express themselves. So in my view, this intelligence has not um, actually advanced very much. Um, I don't think that we have Shakespeare's of today. Uh, I don't think we have Cervantes of today. This, this is what I meant. I did not mean anything else. So maybe I can make myself better understood. What I was saying is that human intelligence is constant for the last 400 years or even 100 years, but what goes up is the machine intelligence. This was my point. Okay, thank you very much. So now uh, I think that we can uh, close uh, your keynote uh, presentation and well, we'll see you in the next one. Okay, so basically I'm going to join now through the other meeting and I'll see everybody who would like to see the presentation of the Erasmus Mundus uh, Master Program on Technology for Translation and Interpreting. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela.